All right, thank you, Ramon. Um, you know, one of the things I want to cover too is, you know, uh, Ramon, you know, I've worked very closely with Ramon uh, with Endeavor, and he's one of the smartest people I've met in, in the functional oh, safety on. realm. <laughs> so, uh, he, and he's actually, at, you know, been the independent chair for uh, over a dozen functional safety assessments. And I, as well, have managed or, or been a project manager for over a dozen functional safety assessments. So we're really excited about presenting, you know, our best practices from our experiences of performing and executing these because there's a lot of information around functional safety assessments, but typically it's very high level. It's, you know, you need to do this and, and win, but we want to go a little bit more in detail of what we've experienced in our best practices for how to do it and how to do it effectively, right? And when to do it and, and all that. Um, I'm also excited that we're doing this presentation before lunch instead of after because I'd rather have a bunch of hungry people listening to me than a bunch of tired people. So uh, thank you for that, whoever scheduled this before lunch. All right, so before we go into functional safety assessments, we need to understand the safety life cycle. So uh, first off, the objectives. The first objective being defining the phases and established requirements for uh, SIS, safety instrument system, safety life cycle activities. So what are the activities that need to need to happen? Uh, so the objectives of the functional safety or uh, the safety life cycle is to establish what those phases are. And we'll go into those phases. Uh, define and organize the technical activities. So doing the, the PHA, doing the LOPA, the SRS, the design, all the way to operating procedures, uh, maintenance procedures, and so on. And then also look, to ensure uh, the adequate planning exists or are developed uh, to ma make certain that the SIS meets safety requirements. So uh, any goal without a plan is just a wish. So it's very important to have a, a functional safety plan. And we'll go into how functional safety planning relates to the functional safety assessment uh, a little bit later in the presentation. But having adequate planning and who is participating uh, in each one of these phases, and then whenever we're executing a functional safety, who's partic participating in those functional safety assessments is very important. And we'll go into who, who, who those resources are. So everybody's seen this diagram. This one's for, from uh, ISA 84. And it, it, it you know, maps out the different phases of uh, the life cycle, the different clauses. And um, you know, there's one path for high severity or, or high integrity uh, IPLs that are identified that's on the left, and you'll see the different your HAZA, your LOPA, and your SRS. So what are the requirements based off of the, the hazards that are identified that can mitigate these, uh, these risks? Then you have the realization phase. So we've identified our hazards, we've, we've identified what the safety requirement specifications are, now let's design them and design them um, and then do the installation commission and validation. So once it's validated, we go into operate maintain where we maintain uh, these protection layers to make sure that they are meeting the requirements that were identified to protect those hazards, um, initially identifying the hazard below, right? So you can see that there, we've identified different stages and we can go into a little bit more detail on what is what activities are done for each stage. So we have our hazard and risk analysis. We do our, our safety requirement specification. It's important to do a stage one FSA. So the only thing in a stage one FSA that we are reviewing or you have an independent chairperson reviewing is that has up LOPA and SRS to make sure that it, it, meet, it meets the requirements or, or that it was done correctly. So stage one is important. Uh, but I think even more important is a stage two. And the reason why I think a stage two is important is because after you identify the requirements, you do the detailed design, you want to have somebody that is independent from either the hazard analysis and that design to review it before you go into the procurement installation commission phase. Because what happens if you wait until a stage three to do an FSA and you find a design flaw? Well, then you're going to have to go back and redesign, re-procure, reinstall commission, which could be very costly to the project and to the schedule of the project. So a stage two, I think, is one of the most important things. It's the most underutilized tool that, that is, is used in the functional safety uh, industry because 
the only required one is, is the stage three, which is prior to startup, doing a stage three. And we'll go into a little bit more detail on each one of these remote. We'll, we'll go into detail in each of the stages. But prior to startup, you have an independent chair do the stage three. So it's basically the legal authority to say, an independent chair reviewed the HAZOP, the SRS, the design, the installation commission validation, you are okay to start up. You're safe to start up. And then once you start up, you go to operate maintain after you get some runtime, and uh, you, you do a stage four FSA where you make sure that the uh, operation procedures, the maintenance procedures that were all identified and created during uh, the install commission validation phase are, are being uh, executed the way it was planned. And then if you're doing any modification or decommission, you want to do a stage five functional safety assessment. So that's uh, illustrating the different stages and how they relate to the safety life cycle. And we'll get a little bit more on uh, what is a functional safety. So uh, per IC 61511 clause 3.2.24, it is an investigation based on evidence to judge the functional safety achieved by one or more SIS and other layers of protection. Okay? So typically it's done with one SIS, can be done with more, but this is a, what a functional safety assessment is. And it's typically done in three different stages as well. Best practice ones. You can do it however you want, but what we've experienced best practices is doing it in three stages where you have a off-site review, so you have the independent chair review the documentation that has been created through the project, depending on what stage you're in. Then they do an on-site review uh, at the facility where they'll interview all of the different resources and, and people that were part of those stages of the functional safety or of the life cycle. And then after that, they might identify action items uh, that need to be closed prior to moving on or action items that can be done later, but uh, that on-site review is very important for that independent chair to, to get with the people that are, are actually doing these activities and make sure that everything is done correctly. And then the post-on-site review activities, the final analysis and the final report. So this is, is, is what we found is the best way to execute <coughs> a functional safety assessment. So why do we do it? Well, it's to identify and correct systematic failures. So as for ISO 26262, a systematic failure is a failure related to <coughs> meets the safety requirements specifications, uh, functional safety and, and safety integrity requirements for each SIF and other protective layers. So we want to make sure that the designs meet the requirements. We want to make sure that the SIL that, uh, or the safety integrity level that's been calculated is meeting the requirements from the uh, layers of protection analysis. So now who can perform it? So who can be the auditor for these functional safety assessments? So it, should, it needs to be a senior competent independent entity, so independent being a key word that we'll get into, um, or organization. So the form of independence can either be by severity of the consequence being addressed by the SIL of the function. So. Uh, a senior competent entity involved in the project design or not involved in the project design. So if you are executing a stage one, a stage two, or a stage three functional safety assessment, you cannot be somebody that was part of that design to be that independent chair because you're not independent. If you're doing a stage four or stage five, you cannot be somebody that is involved in the operating and maintaining of that system because you're not independent. So you can be within the same company but it needs to be somebody that was not part of that design or not part of the operating and maintaining of those safety systems while they're being performed. And then a person that shows up in the battlefield after the battle has been fought and shoots the wounded. That's what an auditor is, right? So technical competency, technical skills, and techniques and methods used to identify systematic error. So you have to know and probably have participated in developing these kind of documentations or, or participated in these life cycle to be able to have the technical competency to identify a systematic error. If you've never you know, been involved with the safety life cycle, you wouldn't be a good auditor because you don't know what you're looking at, right? So also understanding the principles and concepts of the safety life cycle management, 
criteria for accepting a law. And then also assessing and auditing uh, skills necessary, uh, key functional safety document review. So you need to know what you're looking at. You need to know what a HAZOP is, a LOPA and SRS, the design, be able to look at a design and identify any systematic failures that can be identified prior to moving on to the stage. And then general skills, being able to present, document the findings. Uh, if you cannot tell somebody that they're doing something wrong, you probably should be an auditor because uh, you won't. Also behavior uh, competency. So covers the uh, qualities and attributes of behavior that character uh, needed to perform the role of an independent assessor, including maintaining independence without being influenced by the project. So if you are doing a stage three FSA and you find a flaw in the design, it's pretty tough to tell them that they cannot start up. And you can be heavily influenced uh, by the site to say we are starting up anyway. So, uh, you know, you have to be able to be independent and not be heavily influenced by the project because your role as auditor is to make sure that they are being safe, right? That's the ultimate goal of a functional safety assessment is to make sure everything is be being done uh, to the standards, really. And then knowledge. So functional safety, project engineering, and operate maintain knowledge, of course, and then you need to know the standards. If you've never looked at ISA 84 or IEC 61511 or 508, then you probably shouldn't be doing a functional safety assessment. So, um, and in IEC 61511, they describe out the difference between a functional safety assessment and an audit, okay? So we want to just break down what is the difference, because they seem the same, but they're not. So a functional safety assessment, as we talked about, is identifying the systematic error, the mistakes or over oversight in the design, or human error. An audit evaluates the procedures and the documentation to comply with functional safety plan. So we talked about you need a competent person to be executing an FSA. But an audit, you can actually have the quality management um, system department do an audit because you're really just looking at the procedures and making sure people are following the procedures. The, the, the FSA is making sure those procedures meet the requirements around the, the standards. So typically, a functional safety audit, the findings will be the input to the, F, to, to the FSA. So the FSA independent chair is going to want to look at what those the quality management system department has developed around uh, that audit. And then an FSA relies on the competency and experience. We talked about that of the, end of the, uh, of the independent investigator. Uh, and the FSA is the mandatory shall. So you shall do it. You have to do it. Um, now, if you've had a system that's you know, been operating, maintaining, that there was no stage three, then it's required to do stage four. So you need to have um, some documentation that you've had a legal or an independent chairperson review the design uh, and commissioning of, the, of that system. All right, so I'm going to hand this over to Ramon. He's actually going to go through the functional safety workflow and the actual more specifics on each of the stages. Any questions? <coughs> yeah, any questions? Okay, so what I'm going to be covering now is uh, the typical uh, FSA workflow and we're going to be uh, going through uh, detail about this uh, FSA uh, workflow. Typically, uh, regular or normal FSA uh, workflow should follow this uh, path, starting with uh, self-assessment or uh, verification where the IC 1511 uh, cloud number seven, basically uh, you go to the uh, SIA deliverables uh, or functional safety deliverables and uh, do a self-assessment to verify that you uh, meet the uh, safety requirement. So the next step is uh, include the functional safety assessment in your uh, functional safety plan. Okay, and also you gotta plan your FSA. So once, uh, as an independent person, you gotta make a plan. What's gonna be your scope? And what is uh, uh, what you are looking for and what you have to achieve as a part of this. 
So the next step is that, like Zach already mentioned, is the FSA uh, off-site activity that you do uh, prior to the on-site visit. And then you do the uh, FSA on-site visit to the facility. Uh, and then, so once you have uh, basically analyzed the data from the on-site versus the uh, on-site activities, you make the final analysis and uh, do your, or generate action items and then you got your FSA with the results and uh, generate the final FSA uh, report. So planning the FSA, so which activity take place when uh, you plan uh, an FSA? So the first that you gotta do is uh, define scope for your FSA, what is gonna be uh, covering on this uh, review depending on which state of the FSA are you uh, basically working on. So also you need to identify who is going to participate in the FSA. So let's say that I'm uh, doing a stage two FSA, so I need to get involved. The people that did has had a risk assessment, let's say that like a has open local leader. I also need to get involved in this activity uh, to the SIS uh, lead, for example. Uh, we also need to identify role and responsibilities, the skill and authority of the FSA team. So Sam already talked about the uh, that. Resources required to uh, conduct the FSA and the level of independence of the FSA team. That's a key word, independent. So you need an independent person, independent of the work process to conduct an FSA. Um, uh, the information that will be generated as a result of the final FSA report. So FSA, so what kind of activities that uh, you can do when you do the on-site review? So it's basically where part of the uh, key functional safety documents are reviewed. Let's say that you are conducting stage one FSA. What kind of document uh, that you review? Basically, you review a uh, hassle report, local report, and um, the first draft of the safety report and specification. So um, sometimes you can review uh, uh, basically each document against each other. FSA on-site review is basically where the people involved in the safety life cycle activities are interviewed to validate that data already analyzed during the on-site uh, pre-assessment. And also you can do a field work through to verify the uh, field devices and also verify the logistics or installation. Um, uh, Final review your HMI design at the control room. So the post sign a review cover uh, basically the data gathered during the off-site and on-site review, and that data is consolidated, analyzed, and recommendations are made in a report with action item assigned. So depending about the uh, which uh, uh, FSA stage uh, uh, is being reviewed. Um, any, any major gap uh, is identified that impact uh, the overall safety uh, of the facility. So the independent person has the authority to start the unit and start off. For example, if you are uh, conducting or are performing a stage three FSA, so if you see a major safety uh, gap that can impact the safety of your facility, so the independent person has the authority to uh, stop the unit and start off and uh, request to close those gaps before the start off. Any questions so far? Okay, let's talk about now FSA action items. So, so FSA action items can be categorized in uh, three groups. So uh, the first group is a uh, category, so we can call category A or category one. Those are basically action items associated with a significant potential safety gap. And um, those gaps need to be closed before the unit is set up. So, for example, if you are doing a uh, stage three FSA and you find a major gap during that review, so like you say, the independent person has the authority to say, you cannot start your unit until you close that gap. So the second category is basically action considered to be a high priority and those typically are important supporting documentation that need to be complete prior to the project to the final handover to the facility. And the final category is uh, basically more advisory comment based on the uh, observation during the, the whole process. Those typically do not impact uh, safety, compliance, 
again, the ICC 1511, ICC 84, but those recommendations can improve the work process at the facility. So let's talk about now what should be contained in the FSA final report. So what you need to uh, include in your final report once you uh, complete the whole work process. So the first that you need to uh, sure include is the background overview, so a brief introduction about the units that you are have been assessing. So the day that the FSA was started and complete and the location. So who participated in the FSA, the people that was interviewed. Summary and result and uh, also key findings. So key findings need to be included in the report. FSA's interview, so you gotta have a record of uh, all the FSAs uh, or the people that was interviewed with the, the content of those interviews. Uh, action item list. And of course, you use a checklist. So you gotta have copy of those uh, checklists in your final report. Question? Okay. I, got, I got a question. Yes. So walk me through this. Who orders the FSA? Is, is it a plant that's got a unit and they want to They've identified that they want to install some safety equipment, some sys loops, and so they do it all internally, and then uh, they've done their own HAZOP because, I mean, what you're suggesting here is at the FSA level that they would, they would be able to challenge the LOPA HAZOP that is done by the plant, which is done by instrumentation, instrument engineers, maintenance people, the uh, production manager, in other words, everybody that decides what is the hazard, correct? And so then, they're, so they're doing this all themselves, and then they would call in a third-party noted body to perform an FSA to help certify that everything they've done so far is correct through commissioning, startup, and including the life cycle at the end. Is, is that what is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah, that, that's a good question. So. If you have a functional safety plan uh, at the beginning of your project, let's say, you can include uh, the FSA as an activity in your functional safety plan. Let's say that, well, at the front end loading of the project, you can decide, okay, I, I want to do for this project, depending on how large is your project or how small, you can say, okay, for this project, it's a very large project that includes so many safety instrument functions among so many instrument IPLs, is recommended to conduct a stage two FSA and also stage three because stage three is mandatory. So you can include this in your functional safety plan. <coughs> and you can say, okay, at the end of the design, when the design is complete, I want to bring an independent person to conduct a stage two FSA, okay? And you already have this in the functional safety plan and the EPC know that this is a requirement from your facility. Also, you can have, you have said that you have like a technical authority in your facility for functional safety. So the technical authority can do that requirement and say you will need to bring an independent, an independent uh, entity to conduct a stage two and a stage three FSA, for example. Did I answer your question? Any other question? It's also reviewing all the deliverables. So each one of those stages have deliverables in each one of the activities. So is somebody independent reviewing those deliverables and making sure that, yep, everything's good and continue on? Yeah, because you can define, so the purpose of the functional safety plan is that you define at the front end loading of the project all your expectations. You got to define the deliverables on uh, where are you gonna get this deliverable, which phase of the project. Let's say that you start with, uh, your project, uh, functional safety activity in the fine stage, you say, okay, in the fine stage, I need this set of deliverables. And this set of deliverables are gonna be uh, basically issued during the uh, detailed design, for example. But you have to define all of these and who is gonna be responsible for what on each activity. So you have to define your functional safety plan, role and responsibilities. Do you use a checklist of systemic errors that you look for? I mean, they can range all over the map. Yes, what yes. Be, what would be an example? But basically, so let's uh, give an example of the HASOB. If you are conducting a HASOB and you have a checklist for a stage one FSA, uh, typical question is that uh, 
uh, consequence with high severity need to be identified when I say high severity are uh, a scenario that involve uh, permanent disability or fatalities. Those are typical questions that you can have in a, in a FSA checklist for stage one FSA, for example, in the ASO, in the LOPA. So continue with those scenarios. You need to also ensure that those scenarios are included in the LOPA, okay? And you need to mitigate properly those scenarios and, and identify layer of protection when you uh, go and do your uh, LOPA study and you do your seed selection. Those checklists will typically align with the shall requirements throughout the, the, the standards. So for all of the shalls within a safety requirement specification, you want a, the independent chair making sure that each one of those are met. Would uh, a follow-up question, a uh, common thing that I've seen, uh, say personal expectation, when software is developed and you see all kinds of functions, uh, if there is no trace back to either, either the supplier's design spec on how that function is supposed to work, in other words, there's code in there that created, but there's no basis in the specification, would that be on your checklist? That that should be part of this in the specification. Yes, we we currently uh, covering also uh, application program uh, check. As well, so I, I'm going to go for the detail about this. Um, uh, each FSA stage, uh, typical uh, checklist and independent review. What you need to check. So starting with uh, stage one FSA, basically you can do the stage one FSA like, like I mentioned earlier. It's after the uh, hazard risk assessment is conducted, and the first draft of your safety uh, requirement specification is complete. Sometimes called the uh, first draft is just the uh, uh, process sector requirement specification. So the independent review basically focuses on review the, uh, the following document. So they has all the different document. Um, uh, so the review focuses on uh, uh, the all hazard and consequences have been properly uh, identified. Okay, um, uh, the low part in the low part, uh, review, uh, verify the seed selection, each seed, seed selection for seed, as well as uh, uh, any uh, identified additional uh, protection, uh, require a protection layer like a, a safety related alarm that you can tr take credit for uh, closing uh, safety gaps or any uh, additional interlock that doesn't have any seed requirement. Um, uh, for the initial uh, safety requirement specification, basically you verify that all requirements have been captured in the SRF uh, from uh, the, the initial uh, local requirements. The benefits of conducting a stage one FSA is basically so you can identify and fix problem at every stage. That's one of the uh, key benefits of conducting a stage one FSA even before you start with your uh, design. Okay, the stage two FSA, basically the independent review cover, uh, uh, SIG de design review, verify the SIG design meet uh, uh, the SIG target, uh, detailed design like a hardware and software safety requirement, detailed design documentation like a safety requirement specification, SIG calls, uh, test procedures, Seal verification, uh, SIS application program, recommendation action, and from stage one FSA, that's important. If you made recommendation during your stage one FSA, it's important that during the stage two FSA, verify that those action items have been properly closed. The benefit, this is uh, one of the benefits, or probably the most important, any identified efficiency is rel relatively easy to fix and won't impact the project costs uh, significantly. Uh, also won't impact the scale of the project. Stage three FSA is, is Monday for the ICC 1511 and it's after the uh, installation commission and final validation. So independent review focus on installation and commission pro, uh, procedures, operating, testing and maintenance procedure in place, validation that design meet the safety requirement, so like a validation test procedure and executed uh, validation test and report complete. 
recommendation from action item from stage two FSA. Um, uh, the major risk here is a uh, problem um, uh, are found is a uh, potential major cause impact to the project. Sometimes stage three FSA to be too late. So uh, also uh, it will create a score delay to start off because the independent person saying no, oh, you cannot start up your unit <coughs> because you have a major safety gap. And also the independent person will be under a lot of pressure uh, to be at the start of even with the uh, gap still open. Stay for FSA basically covered the uh, operation maintain of this uh, SIS. The independent review focus on uh, when the system has been installed, cover the uh, mechanical integrity program, we ensure that the uh, facility have a mechanical integrity program for SIS and also for any other uh, IPLs. Verify proof testing is undertaken uh, per the SIS requirement. The man is fully strict record, um, analyze, and uh, meet time to federal schools meet the SRS. Field failure recorded and analyzed, basically, for all the random and systematic. Uh, ensure that there is a SIS bypass management work process at the facility. Um, uh, SIS and, uh, and or any instrument IPLR management. So ensure that uh, your uh, SIS uh, or uh, IPLs also have uh, been properly designed according to the requirement for the ISA 18.2 for alarm management. So also that uh, potentially can cover recommendation uh, action item from the stage three FSA. Stage four, uh, stage five FSA that cover basically uh, modification uh, or prior decommissioning uh, for the SIS. The independent review basically uh, focus on reviewing if uh, any documentation, any modification was uh, uh, conducted after the system was installed. So the facility did uh, an analysis to uh, carry out to determine the plan of place <coughs> of the functional safety. Also that the modification were uh, authorized and followed the internal MOC process. Um, uh, modification required review of the appropriate safety life cycle phase. The decommissioning basically covers uh, an analysis that, that was carried out to evaluate the impact of functional safety as a result of the proposed uh, decommissioning activity. So typically, during the FSA work process, that's the people that uh, can be interviewed. So they said, has up a local leader, SIS, an engineer, operational force, uh, project maintenance rep, maintenance design engineer, maintenance design information for different stages, I'm a, or I'm a maintenance planner. Finally, let's talk about the key to success when you perform an FSA. So, keys to success, the first uh, key to success is to include FSA in your functional safety plan at the very beginning of your project. Also, another key to success is conduct a self-assessment or verification. So you should have a standardized checklist for each uh, clause of the uh, safety life cycle. Uh, it's important also to the qualification of the independent person conducting the uh, FSA. Uh, they use a proper tool to facilitate easy access to documentation, documentation and data. That's important to have like a centralized database so where you can have uh, uh, access to your functional safety delivery using just uh, one database. It doesn't have to be a software. You can have like a uh, uh, access database where you can have all your uh, uh, functional safety deliverables in one place. For store documentation, the formatting using a uh, uh, same formatting for your key deliverables and a version control for each uh, uh, functional safety uh, document. Final summary, so I guess, like we said before, implementing a stage three FSA only increase the risk of installing and commissioning major process equipment with improper design. So sometimes it could be too late and can, can basically uh, create uh, delays in the project and a major cost in the project. 
Uh, failed stage three FSA have, uh, can have a significant consequence to the overall capital project schedule, operation, production, and project volume. There is any really sad requirement. <coughs> if the stage two is performed, we have to identify and correct problem areas in a project that will impact the schedule and cost if uh, it is conducted prior to the project uh, procurement. Planning and scheduling FSA is at the beginning of the project as part of the functional safety plan. Tell the APCs and basically uh, know the project's expectation and project deliverables. Those are for stage two.